Good morning. My name is Janice Lilly, and this morning's scripture passage is Isaiah 42, 1 through 9. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This is God's word. Amen. Well, thank you to everyone who's participated so far, from scripture reading to song to prayers. For the five weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to be dipping into passages from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. We're doing this to teach through the new tagline for our church, which says to our church exists to see the weak, wounded, and wayward enjoy the living Jesus. And when I say it's new, it's so new that many of you might not have ever heard us say it before. You might have just even heard it for the first time last week. So that's where we're at. But, but how did we get here? The statement, our church exists to see the weak, wounded, and wayward enjoy the living Jesus came out of nine months of prayer and thinking through among the leaders of our church, the, both the staff pastors and, and the volunteer pastors. And for nine months, as we prayerfully thought about, about the mission that God calls all churches to, and then particularly who God has called our church to be, this statement is where we landed. And I'll tell you this, I'm not a huge vision, values, mission tagline type of person like that's that's not like I don't I don't have a special love for that I'm not doing it in all walks of my life I don't have a personal mission statement or anything like that but when I saw that statement on paper that our church as we there was a number of them different times there was contenders and then there was then there was this one and when I saw this one it was like, it was the first time where I, I stood looking at someone and I said, okay, yeah, that, that right there, that statement, that, that's what I'm trying to do when I preach or, or many other aspects of ministry. It was like this statement was a tuning fork. And as it was brought near to my heart, it was causing passions for ministry and preaching to reverberate. And, and I hope over the next five weeks, it does something like that for you as well. The first word in the passage this morning from Isaiah 42, verse 1, is behold. Behold. It's a command to slow down and to look up. Through the prophet Isaiah, it's as though God tells us to put down our phones and listen with our face. God wants us to know the joy of the living Jesus this week we're looking at is for the wounded. It's for us. I've been competing in sports for the last 30 years, I think, as I was thinking about this. And sometimes at the recreational level, sometimes at the slightly competitive level. <laughs> um, most recently as a dad <laughs> who's just trying to be a better version of me than the, we, the me I was the week before. That's most of my athletics now. 
Um, but over time, I've learned a little bit about injuries, from my own injuries and from watching the injuries of other people. I've become a decent amateur judge of how long a certain injury might keep an athlete sidelined. I have a decent sense of how long it takes for a lightly sprained ankle to heal. So four weeks, not four months. As opposed to broken ribs, which take not four weeks, but four months. But how long does it take to heal from various kinds of abuse? If your former church treated you badly and you show up here, is that like a five-month injury? If you go through the trauma of divorce or widowhood, is that like a five-year injury? I suppose the answer is it depends. Over the last decade of pastoral ministry, I've learned that while I can sort of guess how long an athletic injury might take to heal, my guess about how long it takes to heal from abuse has always been way too short. I'll say it differently. When I was a younger pastor, I'd find myself, not on purpose or to be mean, just out of naivety, I'd find myself looking at the spiritual equivalent of a broken arm and thinking, that'll be better in a couple weeks. When in reality, it takes far longer to recover. The book of Isaiah does not treat the wounds of God's people lightly. God does not treat the wounds of his people lightly. We don't know the exact circumstances around Isaiah's prophecy here that Janice read a moment ago in chapter 42. Isaiah was in ministry a long time, and many of the passages in the book of Isaiah are not dated like ours, so it can be difficult to tell specifically what was happening at the specific prophecy. But I will tell you, if, if you were to flip over, and you don't have to do that, you can stay in Isaiah 42 if you want to. But the very first verse in the very first chapter of the book really sets the wider context for the ministry of Isaiah. So in chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Isaiah, we read this. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, so that's kind of the southern part of Israel. In the days of, he writes, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. These kings tell a story. They give us insights into the social and spiritual milieu that they inhabited. Just as the mention of Washington, or Lincoln, or Nixon, or Trump brings certain images to mind, the mention of these kings should bring to the biblically informed reader certain images to mind. This list of kings also speaks of the length of his ministry, roughly from 740 B.C. to at least 681 B.C., so almost... 60 years. A lot happens during those years. There were a few times of peace and prosperity, but on the whole, there was turmoil, especially amongst the surrounding nations. For example, in 721 BC, so, so basically right in the middle of Isaiah's ministry, the northern kingdom of Israel, he's primarily in the southern kingdom, Isaiah and his ministry, but the northern kingdom of Israel is captured by a foreign army army and carried away into exile. Talk about disruptive. Imagine the top of Pennsylvania <laughs> captured, carried away to Canada, I don't know. Be disruptive, be fearful to live in southern Pennsylvania. I say all of this to point out that the people of God were wounded. To use the words of the passage in Isaiah 42, they were bruised and smoldering, their light, which was supposed to be burning and shining, this, this torch that the nations could see and walk in the light that shone out of Israel, 
Well, that light was almost extinguished. It barely flickered. There were just embers left. Inside the nation, there was infighting and idolatry. And there were, on the outside, wars and rumors of wars and massive cultural shifts. And it's into this context, a wounded context, a promise is whispered to Isaiah, to us. Look with me what, what chapter 42, verse 3 says about the coming Messiah. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He, the Messiah, he, Jesus. Growing up, I had some friends who had a lake behind their backyard, and I remember playing with these. Uh, I, we called them cattails. The, the, the passage calls them, them reeds. And, uh, you know, especially in the late winter, or now after winter, you like, like they, they start to look like this. They start to become dandelions. You can like, they just, they get really soft. But, but my friend and I, we, we, we would play at his house, and uh, we'd take these and we'd snap off the top. <laughs> and then we'd throw them like grenades. <laughs> and they would explode. Uh, it, was, it was a blast. And then we'd take these, especially in the fall. So it was a fine line. Like As the fall goes on, like these get more fluffy. So the grenades exploded better. But the reed, the sword, <laughs> became more fragile. Uh, but we would take these and we, we would play with these. If you go to Wildwood, um, the lake just north of here in Harrisburg, they're, they're, they're all over. And they've gotten thicker over the years, actually, it seems. Um, and we'd use these reeds as swords. But you know what would happen to the reeds? They'd break. They're just not very strong. They'd get flimsy, especially when they get a little crack in them. And all of a sudden, they just, they just snap. We might say in this passage, the words of this passage, they got bruised. And once that happens, it's easy to know what to do next. <laughs> you just throw it away. You just get a new one. There are a thousand of them. What are you going to do fiddling around with this broken reed, as I heard one pastor put it? There are so many ways to become bruised. Many of us have read or at least heard about the evil done by Ravi Zacharias. He was, so we thought, a respected, internationally known Christian teacher. It turns out he was using his fame and power for sexual abuse. We're all aware, at least vaguely, of the same abuse in the Catholic Church, even that took place here in Harrisburg years ago. In fact, last February, the New York Times reported that the local diocese here in Harrisburg declared bankrupts to, quote, protect from creditors as it faced tens of millions of dollars in outstanding claims from people who were sexually abused by clergy members. Two years ago, the Houston Chronicle began reporting that it's not just a problem for the Catholic Church, but the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest denomination, Protestant denomination in the world. Maybe some of you followed a little bit before that the reporting done by Julie Royce in the World Magazine on Harvest Church in Chicago and their former pastor, James McDonald. Not necessarily sexual sin, but abuse of power nonetheless. And we could go on and on. Some of these cases perhaps getting closer to home. I think of a ministry friend of mine who, along with other staff, addressed in pointed questions the verbal and emotional abuse of one of the leaders of a large church and the staff was promptly dismissed and forced to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. In other words, they told my friend, you're not leaving this room until you take this money and agree to not talk about it. He just moved to the city, newly married, bought a house, and it all happened so fast he didn't even know it was happening. So he signed it. And there are many ways to become bruised. Some of you were exposed to pornography at an early age. Others grew up with a belligerent father, and now every time a man raises his voice, you just become disproportionately afraid. Some of you have had loved ones who have committed suicide. 
Perhaps your local business was steamrolled by a larger corporation. Some of you suffer with chronic illness. All of us, to one degree or another, struggled with aspects related to COVID last year. There are so many ways to become bruised. One of my sisters is adopted. She was actually my cousin before she was adopted. When she was a baby, while she slept in her crib, her mother was murdered in the room next door. I think I was about 10 when we adopted her. I can just remember for the longest time being afraid at night. There's so many ways to become bruised. My friend Chris Thomas, he's a pastor in Australia. I've quoted him once before, a long time ago in a service. But he wrote an article recently about his adopted son. He says, my son's brain was irreparably damaged due to exposure to alcohol in his mother's womb, in the place where he was being knit together, a place that is designed to hide the vulnerable from harm. He could not escape the poison his mother drank in an attempt to hide from her own pain. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder means that as his body adapts to the teenage years, his brain lags far behind. There's so many ways to become bruised. And some of you are listening, and to be candid, you're a tough guy. And, and, and all this talk of being bruised and wounded, it's not for you. Maybe. But a few of you needed to also be asked this question. If you're so tough, why does everyone in your life, at your workplace, at your home, have to handle you with mittens? If you're so tough, why does your family need to walk on eggshells around you? It might be because you're wounded, not tough. And to protect yourself, you've become this snapping turtle with this shell and the teeth. And, 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 and never, no one can ever know you. No one ever can know your heart. There are so many ways to become bruised. In fact, I think of the passage in Romans 8 where, where Paul writes that we read not only of people, but all creation groans in futility under the weight of of being subjected to fertility because of sin, Romans 8, 22. What is God to do with a people like us? Just throw us away? If you have a grocery bag from Giant or Target, it gets a little plastic grocery bag, gets a rip in it, you don't, you don't try and save it. It's a plastic grocery bag. You just, just wad it up and you throw it away. There's a billion other grocery bags. You don't waste your time duct taping an old ruined bag. Well, our Savior is not like that. He's not like that. In Isaiah 42, we read about the strong compassion of our healer. You see, when Isaiah writes that a bruised reed he will not break, verse 3, it's not that he can't break a reed. He could break us. Our Savior is strong. It's like, it's like we're this wounded hummingbird in the hand or the paw of a lion. It could crush us with no effort. Or he could set us down underneath him. And protect us while we heal. Which is what he does. Look with me again at verses 1 and 6. Behold, my servant. We know in the New Testament, more Trinitarian context, as it's more clear. Looking back, the New Testament, even as it quotes this passage, we know that, behold, my servant, God the Father, speaking to God the Son, saying, behold, my servant, whom I uphold. My chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Coming down to verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. That you there is singular, not plural. 
to the nation of Israel. I have called you Messiah in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. This Messiah is no ordinary person. The Messiah is in a special relationship with the Lord. God the Father, behold, the five statements in this passage about their relationship. The Lord considers the Messiah his servant. The Lord upholds the Messiah. The Lord chooses the Messiah. The Lord delights in the Messiah. The Lord puts his spirit upon the Messiah in a powerful way. This Messiah is no ordinary person. Our healer is both strong and gentle. And in his strength, we read that he will bring justice to the distant nations, the coastlands, it says, without getting tired of being gracious. Look at verse 4. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, the coastlands, the farthest out places Israel could have imagined. Wait, verse 4, for his law. Now, those words about justice and law probably don't communicate to you what they should, at least as we hear them. When we hear law, we think of God's commands, and and there's a, a truth to that. We should think of the shoulds and should nots. But, but, but what is being described here is a just society. Shalom. It, it's saying that war-torn villages will have peace. It's saying that there'll be no more sex trafficking. It's saying that the Messiah is going to bring in a day when you don't have to lock your door at night. I've told many of you, at least you know, if, if you've been around me outside of church on Sunday over the last couple weeks, I might have told you, and some of you I've told you a bunch about this, uh, I was so excited for jury duty. I know that makes me weird. I was super excited. Um, and my day in court finally came this last week, and, and I showed up at 8 a.m. thinking I was the second alternate, because that's what they told me I was. I was. And I show up and I realize I'm not the second alternate, I'm on the jury. And then after seven hours of testimony, everyone left the courtroom but the 12 jurors and they made me the foreman. And through nearly four hours of intense deliberation, um, I led a diverse group of strangers to a unanimous decision We were not unanimous when we started. To do what we all believed was the right thing. And then I stood up and I had to read the guilty sentence six times. As the person, probably about where you are, David, looking right at me until he hung his head. And I came home 12 hours after I arrived at the courthouse, thankful for the way God had used me. But I also came home exhausted. I woke up that day, the next day, with one of the largest emotional letdowns I've ever had. I was sad, depressed. It just took everything out of me that day. And then I read verse 4, and I smile. Isaiah writes, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he's established justice in the earth. Our Savior has the strength to do what we don't. That's a good thing. That's what makes him our Savior. I mentioned sports injuries at the beginning of the sermon. And while injuries are usually not the fault of the person who becomes injured, usually the person does have a responsibility in their recovery. A lightly strange hamstring, so the back of your leg, Um, lightly strained, strained. six weeks of recovery, if you treat it right. But if you don't, it might not heal properly. I assume there are parallels to other kinds of bruising. When a doctor prescribes treatment for you, that's not busy work. When a physical therapist says, I need you to do this 
every day for 20 minutes, that's not to hurt you. That's to help you. Because the living Jesus loves you and wants to restore your joy, our joy, he also wants to see you reading his word every day, praying to him, and involved in meaningful ways with Christian community, specifically in a local church. I'll say that again. Because, because the living Jesus wants to restore your joy and to see you and I built up. In his grace, he wants to see us reading his word every day, praying to him and belonging in meaningful ways to Christian communities, specifically in the local church. And he wants you to participate in your recovery. For some of you, you might need Christian counseling. There's no shame in that. There are many counselors that attend our church. Connect you to one of them or the dozens of good ones in Harrisburg, I think, that are around in Harrisburg that are not a part of our church? Some of you, you feel like your heart hurts so bad. The only thing you can do, it takes everything in you just to come to church in the morning. And, and you just sit here and you stand and you mouth the words of the songs because you, you can't even bring your hearts to sing them, but you just mouth them so that people don't notice. Please know, that's okay. A bruised reed, he will not break. Jesus can make us whole again because he was wounded for us. Later in the book of Isaiah, we come to chapter 53, which Pastor David's going to be preaching on Good Friday. And we read that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 53 verse 4, with his wounds... We are healed. God loves you so much. He wants to make you whole again. And whatever healing is left undone in this life, he will see it to perfection in the next. We have a wonderful Savior. Would you join me in prayer as we invite the worship team back up? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the thousand ways you are not like us. We would move on, find a better people, find a better pastor, find a better Christian. But you are, as the scriptures say, long-suffering. You're patient. We thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you for the way that the Messiah knows is like us. <laughs> in knowing what it means to be fragile and wounded. Specifically, wounded in his atonement for us on the cross. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters and those who are just checking out this church, checking out Christianity, they're feeling the fringe. I just pray that in the overflowing love of the gospel, you would lift hearts and encourage us and strengthen us and shed your favor in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.